So Robert Motherwell was born in 1915 in Aberdeen, Washington. His family moved around for a bit on the West Coast, and then they settled in Northern California in 1926. Um, and uh, Robert Motherwell was born into a wealthy erudite family. His father became president of the Wells Fargo Bank, so there's a little tenuous connection to Charlotte there. Um, and he did take classes at the California School of the Arts, um, particularly in painting, but he really focused his studies at Stanford University on philosophy, with a little sideline in uh, literature. Um, and that was really a big influence from his father, who was very nervous with Mother Well committing to a career as an artist. He wanted him to have something that was a little more marketable and encouraged him to get a humanities degree to the point where he bribed him at, what was it, $50 a week for the rest of his life, which was a lot of money in the 30s and 40s. Oh my God, I would have done anything for that <laughs> stipend for the rest of my life. Um, so he graduates from Stanford in 1937 with that degree, but he takes um, some time off to travel Europe with his father and sister. And this is really a life-changing trip. At that time, he picks up a copy of James Joyce's Ulysses. And one, um, thing, one thing about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he Tell me the story. Because well, so he this. bought it at um, Shakespeare and Company. Mm. In Paris, in Paris because you couldn't get it in the United States. Oh yes, because it was banned. It was banned. <sighs> it so was, sexy in a weird way. It was yeah. his uh, <laughs> first kind of uh, independent move to radicalized, you know, kind of being. And so anyway, that's yeah, which is a perfect time because one of the themes that will be recurring in the next ten, possibly now fifteen minutes, um, is that there is that element of the European. Um, not only the radicalism, but also this idea of um, pulling on to all different types of media and sources, and so. Right, and and you know one of the things that fed into that was his ability to speak French, mm -hmm. though poorly, good enough and better than any of the other artists in the New York School, good enough so that when the artist that had to leave mm -hmm. France and uh, you know in 1940 and came to the States. And there was a, a, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the number and the names, but you know, he was one of the guys who met them and translated and helped them find places to live and helped, uh, for instance, Mondrian mm -hmm. uh, get together with, um, what was the name of his patron, the guy that was with him forever. Oh, I actually don't uh, know. Anyway, so he found him a place to live. He found mm -hmm. his studio on Fifth Avenue, all these things. And, um, and so consequently, he was right in the mix mm -hmm. of European modernism in 1940. And he could read very well yes. French. And so he translated those works, and he was familiar with all of those ideas. Right. And so in addition to those personal introductions, he was able to also introduce the public in the United States to all of the writing and the philosophy and the important critical reception those right. European artists had received across the pond. Um, and he very importantly translated a book of writing by the Dada and Surrealists in 1951, which really changed the course, I would argue, well, everyone argues this, it's not just me, um, of art making in the United States. Um, can you also tell the story, because Mary loves this story, of him making his father crazy on the train with Joyce's Mm, I don't know that book. one. But I believe it was that he got the book and he was reading it obsessively. And then I think he was reading passages out loud mm -hmm. um, and it was making his father crazy. And that sort of like also was an added plus It was having a, the book. He had a difficult relationship with both of his parents mm -hmm. because they were very conservative people. And, and I think he, you know, although well-educated, mm -hmm. they, they definitely were looking to him to move away from this art thing <laughs> as much as possible. <laughs> and so to he did bribing him. Well, to the point of bribing him and he did actually move entirely across the country to, yeah. to get away from that. Um, I actually I hesitate to ask this because I don't like bringing too much biography into an artist's analysis. But so they go to Europe for a long extended period of time yeah. without his mother. Yeah. He was not <laughs> well yes. His mother and and Bob, I mean, I didn't know Bob, so I've gotten all these stories yeah. secondhand, of course. But because I couldn't find anything in the literature about his mother, he it's always his father. He never really talked about his mother either. That's interesting. And um, his mother and he had a had a really really tumultuous relationship mm -hmm. by all accounts that I've heard. 
and um, his father was, uh, was kind of a cold and aloof character, um, but at least relatable on that kind of male-to-male -male uh -huh. Whereas I think with Bob and his mom that they just, he, he was such a disappointment to her, is basically how it translates to me. And oh so she kind of withheld love, kind of tortured him with that, mm -hmm. and, um, and he felt that he, he was a shy man through his entire adulthood, and he was very dependent on women. He mm -hmm. always... Um, yeah, there were a lot of wives. There were a lot of wives. He had, <laughs> he had four wives. Dynamic wives. And, and um, you know, it seemed like once a relationship was over, he immediately started another relationship that started with a marriage. He was a very, um, you know... Um, traditional in Traditional a way. in a way. <laughs> and, and, Make this legit. And wanted the relationship, you know, yeah. a real relationship, a strong relationship. But um, I think until until his final wife, he really never had that. Mm -hmm. oh, and I think that was the instability from his mother. That's my, I mean, uh, amateur psychiatrist kind of Yeah. Take. It just fascinated me that they would go for such a long <laughs> period of time, not just his father and himself, but also to bring the sister. Yeah. So I was like, was she in a mental institution? Did she die? Like for a while, I was like, surely she died. Yeah. But yeah. That's interesting and sad, mm. but thank you. Yeah. I really wondered Art about that. Art comes from many places. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to the boring part of the biography and lineage. So he um, graduates Stanford um, and makes this deal with his dad. So he goes to Harvard and he decides I'll go there and study philosophy for a little while, paint on the side. So he does that for a little bit. And then the professor at Harvard is like, you really need to go to Columbia and you need to study art history with Meyer Shapiro because this is going to make your life so much better. And so he does that. And Meyer Shapiro does, in fact, change how, I would argue, Mother World sees the world. Now, Meyer Shapiro is one of those exiles from Europe that Morgan was talking about. Um, he was an art historian connected with all of the contemporary artists who came over, all those Dada and Surrealists and all of the modern artists. But he was revolutionary in a number of ways. One of them was that he did do traditional art history. He did classicism to Romanesque, to medi uh, medieval to Romanesque, to Gothic, you know, that whole traditional lineage. But he also talked about the present day artists. He talked about contemporary art. And he would do this in the same, you know, he'd be talking about some Romanesque cathedral one week, and then the next week he'd be talking about Mondrian. And so this conversion of the deigned art history with art that was being made that day and really kind of ruffled people's feathers, scared people, confused people. People thought it was sloppy and not very well done by amateurs. And Shapiro was really one of the few people in the academy who was saying, no, in fact, this stuff is important, it's interesting, it deserves to be talked about in the same context as all of these masters like Michelangelo and Raphael. And we need to start thinking about it in those terms. So Motherwell, from him, learned this idea that art was something that could be, any art form could be considered a form of exploration and creativity regardless of the time period it was made or how it necessarily fit into that historical context immediately. Um, so the other thing that I find really interesting about this, though, is that Shapiro was doing all of this thinking and criticizing um, without the benefit of historical distance. So it was all in the moment, and he would come up with these incredibly complex analyses and make these grand proclamations, and he'd write them down, and he'd say them at Columbia. And then like 10 years later, he'd be like, I, you know what, some time has passed. I was hugely wrong about that artist. Not only do I think everything I said was wrong, but he's terrible, and I'm <laughs> so sorry. Um, but what I loved about that was that, A, he was humble enough, and I know some of his students, and they argue with me every time I say he was humble, but I say this is an act of humbleness, but, or humility, but he would admit that he was wrong, and he wouldn't go back and like get rid of that record, he wouldn't destroy it, he wouldn't modify it when he published those um, omnibuses that collected all of his writing. Um, he would just say, look, 
I wrote something in 1945, it's like, you know, 60 pages before this essay, and now I think this. So he left that original comment in place in the historic record, and then we thought it later and gave that explanation. But what you had as a result was this evolution of his thought process, his understanding of all of these things that were happening, and you were able to trace that development from the beginning of his work until his death. And a similar thing happens with Robert Motherwell, where you get this moment at the beginning where he's interested in all of these ideas and all of these concepts and um, automation and all of automatism and all of these different approaches to mixing. And then you see it with the printmaking. And he allows all of that exploration and all of that self-education to appear there on the page. And with all of those works that we have at the end of his life, we're able to trace this arc of development of editing, of reinvestigating and reconsidering things that he had done decades before. Um, so Shapiro also is key in introducing Motherwell to all of those emigres who are coming to New York City. And one of the most important, oh, he also tells him you should leave school and just go be a painter. And so Motherwell does in fact, uh, just showing the 8th Street studio. So Motherwell does in fact leave and he takes a studio on 8th Street around the corner from Cedar Tavern where all the New York abstract expressionists are hanging out. Um, and he starts painting. One other thing about Shapiro, yeah. Shapiro was a painter himself. And, oh yeah. And so I think you know he could relate to these artists in a different kind of way than most art historians. And, That's true. And Motherwell <coughs> used to bug him by you know, bringing his work over to show him to get critiques. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it finally got to the point where he, he was living in Greenwich Village right near where Shapiro lived. And it got to the point where, he, where Shapiro said, hey, Bob, you know, oh, no. there are these other artists. <laughs> you should go talk to them, you know. And so that got him out into the world more. I mean, he actually did then seek out his peers like Pollock and like yeah. de Kooning, but also, you know, pushed him into the emigre camp more. That's so interesting because I always had the impression, because Motherwell is so connected to everybody, yeah. that he in fact was this very social, very dynamic figure in those comfortable circles. Like when he was with other thinkers or writers or musicians or artists, he was very socially comfortable. But yeah. that wasn't... No, no, he so was, but he didn't know at that point how to find oh. it. And yeah. so Shapiro was his gateway, sort of, you know, yeah. and pushed him out into the world. Yeah. Aww. Yeah, That's sweet. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of those artists that he introduces him to is Mata. He meets Mata, and Mata introduces him to the surrealism idea of um, automatism and the idea that you can just draw without doing studies, without any sort of preconceived notions, and you sort of draw from your subconscious and you create these drawings that could have just as much importance and just just as much um, artistic validity as anything that you would do after repeated studies. Um, Mata brings him, they travel around together for a while and they go down to Mexico and there in Mexico they meet Wolfgang Palin, another emigre who has left and has um, settled in Mexico. Um, and Motherwell becomes so attached to Palin that he um, stays after Mata leaves and he stays through the fall and works with him. Um, Palin was a very important writer and um, sort of coalescer of all the other artists who were writing at that time and he um, published a journal called Dine, which Motherwell worked on. And here there's this other uh, moment where Motherwell is realizing that it's not just making the work and maybe talking about the work with other artists, but also writing down your thoughts on your work and your process and publishing that and getting it out into the world and circulating it. That becomes um, important to him going forward. And fortunately, we have wonderful collections of Motherwell's writing. He's poetic and fascinating and interesting. Um, and then here are just examples of that automatism that became key to his work. And you can see how this resonates throughout all of the prints around us.
Um, so Mother Well is part of that New York uh, abstract expressionist circle. Um, he's one of the youngest in the lot. Um, and he actually has a career that is very different than the artists that we're familiar with. And I'm showing you here him with Mark Rothko um, and with Bradley Walker Tomlin uh, with some of their paintings. Um, and one of the reasons why he goes on to not only um, work in painting, but also in collage and printmaking um, to really focus on writing and um, to also draw from many other sources is because he had that contact with Europe because and Mexico because he was traveling so much and because um, he had this broader view of not only what an artist could be, how they would move about in the world, but also um, the other art that was out there in the world and how to draw on that and incorporate it into their work. Um, and one of the things that comes with that European connection is this respect for all other art forms and seeing them not only as potential source material but also potential collaborators. Um, writing, as we've talked about with James Joyce and Ulysses, was very important to Motherwell throughout his life and he did a number of beautiful collaborations both with living artists and with their texts. Um, and I'm showing here my tiny slideshow, um, the illustrations he did um, for Rafael Alberti's A la Pintura, um, which is here, and then also um, his illustrations for Ulysses that he did towards the end of his life. Um, he also was very influenced by music. In fact, the lyric suite comes from Albert Berg's own uh, sweet quartet that he did. Um, and then politics was very important to Motherwell. And that was another source material that really influenced and informed a lot of the paintings that he did. These are paintings he did, uh, The Little Spanish Prisoner, Pancho Villa Dead and Alive that he did after his trip to Mexico. And then of course, the Spanish Elegy series that I think everyone is familiar with, which he started in 1948 and continued really for decades <coughs> afterwards. Um, exploring different forms of that. And I threw this in here. Um, this is a painting that Motherwell did Dublin 1916 with black and tan. Um, it is his um, sort of ode to the Irish rebellion. Um, and this was his Guernica. So the other thing that was going on in Europe that was, um, that Motherwell was exposed to more so than any of the artists who weren't traveling was printmaking. Now printmaking had been a standard, respected, beautifully exploited art form throughout Europe, throughout centuries. Not too much in the United States where it was really seen as a commercial form. It had this blip of success and interesting production during the WPA period. And, uh, but in fact, it wasn't really embraced in the United States until the 50s when a number of artists who had gone over to Europe um, and experienced printmaking in that um, on that continent realized the rich, um, unusual surfaces and material relationship between the ink and the paper that could be achieved through printmaking. And they came back to the United States and started to build all of these print shops across the country. Now by the time Motherwell becomes mature as an artist and interested in printmaking, these shops have matured themselves and they have a number of master printers who are able to work with them. Ken Tyler is one of the exceptional ones um, who, who actually did all of the prints that we're gonna be seeing shortly. So when I was doing this research, I came across these little brochures that my grandmother kept for reasons that are unclear to me because she didn't have mother wells. But this <laughs> is a Gemini sales oh my packet. God. Yeah, I remember <laughs> those, yeah. I know. <laughs> so it's got these wonderful reproductions with the price list. Um, so this is when it first came out, so 1974, 1973, sorry, but this is done in 74. And number two is edition 55, $375. Now, I know, don't get sad because it gets worse very quickly. So <laughs> <laughs> then I have the Associated American Artists who also showed slash sold this print in 1988. 
And so 15 years later, it is now up to $3,800. That's an amazing increase. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And what that reflected really was the fact, just as you alluded to, that printmaking suddenly became an important medium. Mm -hmm. And most of the important artists that were, you know, sort of leading cutting edge artists got involved with printmaking. So Gemini, mm -hmm. Tyler, um, Irwin Hollander in New York, there were several, Lee. yeah, several shops that, that people could work with and they were promoting this stuff and getting it out to dealers. And I remember in the 70s, right around that time when I first started working for Richard Gray, we actually had a print room that was just dedicated to, oh these, God, a, to yeah. these additions and people used to come. And, and of course, one of the markets that developed was um, for businesses, mm -hmm. corporations started making collections. And so Lincoln Center, Remember Lincoln that, that Center. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it was a it was a, a sea change mm -hmm. in, in both the art business and also, you know, for artists to have another medium that they could work on. And one of the great things, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, as, and this is especially true in Motherwell's case, the idea of collaborating with a master mm -hmm. printer was really attractive to these guys because, you know, somebody most of the time when you're a painter, you're working by yourself in a studio forever, you know, and maybe you have an assistant or two running around, but the real deal was you and whatever it was that you're making. And so you don't get an instantaneous response about mm -hmm. an idea. Whereas if you're working with a master printer, you do a proof, you look at it, you talk about it, you think about it, you do several proofs, you d try different colors, you try different textures, you try different papers, mm -hmm. and all of that for Bob was really exciting. And it's a sustained relationship. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Alain Pinture, that was yeah. six years, yeah. four years? Yeah, it was a long Tatiana time. Impressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, ULAE, which was on Long Island, mm -hmm. which she was also uh, a formidable. force of nature. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I love her. Yeah. Um, also a fascinating character in the history of art. Yeah. Um, so all of that. <laughs> um, and Motherwell um, was actually really one of the more conservative printmakers um, working with these people. So what I'm showing here, I'm showing the Rauschenberg cardboard yeah. and the Keenholz door. Yeah, yeah. Um, so these are also made by Ken Tyler at Gemini. Um, that was one of Ken's big things was mm -hmm. that he decided, you know, you don't have to make prints on paper. You, yeah. can, you can make anything you really want. I'll figure out how to do it. And that's why people flocked to him. And it was the challenge. Yeah. To do it, and then a number of other uh, print shops kind of picked up this mantle. So Crown Point Press, that yeah. was also their big pitch. Um, but Motherwell really did maintain this traditional approach to printmaking. I mean, it was very experimental in a number of ways, but there was still there wasn't the crazy like I'm going to make cardboard and I'm going to print on glass and put it in a car window, um, because the most important thing to him in all of his work is the brush, the brush and the medium. And this is where printmaking was in fact essential to his development as an artist, more so than someone like Robert Rauschenberg or Ed Keenholz, um, or even I would argue June Wayne, who was incredibly important in the printmaking revolution in this country. Um, but he wanted to maintain that tradition from painting into his printmaking with the medium, the paint medium, and the brush, and maintaining that movement, that integration, that texture, and that play with all of those elements together, the paper, the importance of that. We had talked about, like, we had a number of points that we were gonna talk about. Was there anything that you wanted to start with, or maybe just the importance of monotypes in particular to his print development? So, yeah, I, I, that's a great place to start. I mean, he, he as we said, was fascinated by printmaking, loved the collaborative process. Um, when he was finally able to set up the perfect studio situation for himself, which, was, which he did in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, he bought a house. He wanted to get outside of town. He was uh, divorcing his third wife, Helen Frankenthaler. Um, so he needed a change. And he had enough money to be able to do exactly what he wanted. So he made a, a studio that was uh, set up 
in a uh, former carriage house and big long space and he divided it into three studios. So there's a big painting studio and a collage studio on the other end and in between he put a printmaking studio. And that allowed him to walk around and sort of interact with a printmaker while he or she was, you know, proofing things. And that stimulated so much of his work from that point forward. Mm. You know, that was a, uh, I think, a turning point for him. And it was, uh, he hired a full-time printmaker. Catherine Mosley. Catherine Mosley. Who was usually helpful and gave a ton of time to the research for this. She worked on monotypes with him. Mm -hmm. um, and she was his etching. Uh, she did the aqua tint and the etchings as right, well. Right, right. So, um, when he decided to do monotypes, and I'm not actually sure how they st started, you know, I mean, I think it was just fooling around and then thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I should do this, you know, maybe I should really try this. And then engaging, um, I think the first set was done with Bob Bigelow, was it? Yes, it was, and Brooke Alexander. And Brooke Alexander. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so he engaged them in you know, they got together all the materials that were needed, all the different prints, uh, sorry, papers and inks, and um, and Bob wanted to use paint because he was more familiar with paint, and he wanted to, you know, he knew how the paper would react to the paint. So they set up this whole process, and of course, um, <laughs> the first I think it was tantrum. Yeah, the first <laughs> the first hiccup was. Uh, Brooke Alexander shows up and says, you know, we're all set. Come on downstairs, Bob. We want you to work. And Bob says, I, I don't really feel like making monotypes today. <laughs> so, and Brooke's come up from New York City. He got a, paint, a printer on site for two days. Right. He's invested. Set aside a whole weekend of money. everybody's time. And yeah. Bob walked downstairs and said, mm, and uh, so Brooke had to. <laughs> not today. Yeah, not today. We'll do it another time. But. Um, Brooke was persistent because Brooke wanted some product and, uh, <laughs> and he knew how to convince Bob and so he got him going. And, and part of it was, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, and I don't know if it's widely known, but Bob was very much of uh, a tough start. You know, mm -hmm. He would wake up, he, he liked to work at night, so he often worked until three or four or five o'clock in the morning. So he'd get up at 11 or 12 and wander down to the studio and a lot of days he had a hard time starting. He didn't know where to start, didn't know what to start on. That was one of the great things about having a printmaker there mm -hmm. making proofs. They could talk about it. He might want to noodle around on a proof and play and that would get his hand moving and then he'd start to paint in the studio. But a lot of times he was blocked. And he had any number of rooms. If he was blocked, he could, oh, I'll go make collages yeah, or I'll yeah, go work on that painting. Yeah. And But also at that time he was distracted a lot because mm -hmm. he was editing books, he yeah, was yeah. writing articles, he was often yeah. asked to talk, mm -hmm. you know, give give lectures, and um, so he had a lot going on. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and the other unusual thing, here he's staring at stones, lithography stones on his floor, um, and here there are etching plates that he, um, he would leave these plates out, or he would pull a proof and then he would leave it out for weeks, sometimes months, as he thought about what it was, how to change it, what he wanted to do with it. Um, and he did that with a lot of his works, the collages, the paintings. Oh yeah. But monotypes, you can't do that. Like you have to finish it that day because the ink's gonna dry, it's get, gonna get too gummy. He was very specific about the consistency of his inks. Um, and so this was another particular medium that wasn't so conducive to you know, fluttering around to different things when you get blocked. Right, right. You have to concentrate, you have to be there. And, and actually one of the great things about his work, the thing that always attracted me mm -hmm. was that commitment. You know, he would make a mark, it stayed there. It was kind of that yeah. automatism thing, you know, was his touchstone uh, throughout his career. And so this lends itself, this medium lends itself perfectly to that because you know, you put that ink down, just like Gerald's demonstration, you know, you put that paint down and you pick it up. You can't really run it through the press again. Yeah. You can't really. You can't. Yeah. You can set, set a second piece of paper mm -hmm. down. And sometimes he would do that to get a ghost image if he liked an image. Yep. Like, like let's say this, yeah. you know, he would run it through again and pick up the remnants of whatever mm -hmm. ink was on there. 
and it would be a soft image, and then you could do a monotype on top of that or paint on top of that. And we have those examples, the 1976s in the front, where right. he just could not, could not do it that day. And so he made sheets of paper. <laughs> Like he was yeah. just like, I'm just gonna make some colored paper today. Yeah. I'll use that some other time. Right, right. Um, it was interesting to me, this is kind of a side note, but I'm doing a project uh, for the San Francis Foundation on San Francis's prints. And those are two artists, both from Northern California, both who spent a lot of time in Europe, who have this similar approach to printmaking started yeah. off as monumental painters yeah. and then really explore and exploit the printmaking medium. Did Sam make prints when he was in Europe? Do, you know, he did. did it in he, Paris? His first in Switzerland. In Switzerland. That was the first time he started yeah. doing prints. Yeah, with interesting. Those. Yeah, um, yeah. I was going to do this whole thing about Motherwell at saint Galen, but yeah, don't. We're not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we shall not. Um, and I wanted to talk a bit more about that collaborative process with the printmakers because Catherine Mosley was there every day lurking. Ken Tyler at least was down the road, but he did bring in his own lithographer yeah. as well. Yeah. So he was starting to have staff when for so long he'd been alone in the studio right. working. Right. Do you see, in general, that dynamic affecting all of his production, or because that's a very different I think dynamic di at work? I, I think it really did because he was much more productive. Interesting. You know, in the seventies and eighties, even as his health started to fail somewhat, mm -hmm. he was very productive. And I think it was, as you said, you know, he really liked to have his own work around. He would leave these plates out. Mm -hmm. So he had somebody who could set things out mm -hmm. and he could look at them and react to them. And sometimes when he was blocked, and sometimes this didn't work out so well, you know, he'd grab a work that he had made maybe even 10 years before, but he wanted to look at it again. And then he'd pick up some pink paint and sort of, you know, doodle in the corner of that to, to change it and, and mess around with how the, the surface was or how the color relationship was. And and that would get him started uh -huh. on whatever painting or collage project he was working on that day. But I do think having the people around, and of course, uh, I worked with Joan Bannock for years, who worked at the foundation, who was his last studio manager. Mm -hmm. And she used to say, you know, it was good and bad, right? Because Bob was a Depression era kid. And so he'd see a printmaker you know, who was supposed to be making prints, but if Bob didn't make a print, then the printmaker didn't have anything to do, but he was just sort of standing around. So then Bob would say, well, I better make a print because yeah. I'm paying this guy, Yeah. you know, and- Catherine said she manipulated him all the time yeah. that way. Yeah, you, She would like become more visible if he hadn't been working right. in like a week, and so she'd just make sure he saw, saw her. Saw her, and then he would walk into the print studio. Yeah, yeah they had a great relationship too, you know. Which, oh, she adores him. Yeah, yeah. He bought her a car, he bought her her <laughs> He I gave mean, her her he gave her copies of everything that she worked yeah, on, she all the prints, them. and she had yeah she had a great collection of them. It's amazing. Yeah, and he sent her to college. <laughs> I mean, to grad school. Yes, yes. I mean, he was incredibly generous. He was incredibly his... generous, but you know, and that's part of the revolution of the print market too. Yeah, you know, it's true. Artists used to have to rely on a, a usually a single dealer, but you know maybe they were good enough to have several dealers spread across the country or maybe even in Europe, but they'd sold paintings and drawings and you could only make so many of those, but you could make an addition of prints mm -hmm. that Ken Tyler could distribute across the country to 40 different dealers. Mm -hmm. And so you broadened your audience, you broadened the market, you know, meaning the, the amount of money that people had to spend to collect. Mm -hmm. All of those things changed and, and so consequently, in the 70s and 80s, he was more financially sound than he'd ever been in his life. And also because with this new revolution in product, he wasn't working with galleries a lot of the times yeah. or edition makers. Brooke Alexander and he worked together frequently. Right. But, and Ken. Um, and Ken. Ken. Ken but Tyler. Catherine Mosley talked about this a great deal too, and I don't think it made it into the essay. Um, but she said, like, he realized pretty early on that he could control his inventory right. and that he could sell it directly. He could be his own publisher. Yeah. Yeah. Which like, was printed money. Hu yeah, printed exactly. Money. Hugely unusual. Yeah. And not many artists followed that, actually. Not Sam many Francis people. did. Yeah. He had yeah, his own he print was. Shop. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I want to know if they like, knew each other and talked well, about it. Well, so like, one of the things. We that can do this. Another yeah, thing, no, sorry, another thing that happened, I think, too, out of this was that because he was so financially sound, yeah. 
through the prince, he didn't want to sell as many works because he already had this idea. Huh. The idea of the foundation really started in 1981 and probably a couple so of years. well it before he died. Yeah, it formed in 1981. So it probably started, I think, four years before that. He'd been approached by a museum mm -hmm. to give works to them to have a permanent installation. And he really wanted to do that, but he realized that you know there's also a tax advantage to doing that somehow. So he tried yeah. to figure that out. And, um, and he came up with the idea of the foundation right at the moment when he was, you know, able to take care of everything out of print sales. So we, when he died in 1991, we inherited over 6,000 works of art. We inherited everything that was in his studio. And while a lot of them were prints, you know, probably more than half were prints, that left 3,000 paintings, drawings, works on paper, monotypes. Oh my gosh. And I'm convinced that he kept a lot of that. He, he put, in the last 15 years, 20 years of his life, very high prices when he showed things mm -hmm. at, at galleries. And you know, people had to face a stiff curve to be able to acquire it. Um, but he got to keep it. Mm -hmm. And that formed the basis oh of the foundation. It's a kind of hoarding. It is a kind of hoarding <laughs> with a purpose, you know. With a justified a, hoarding, yeah, but it's a hoarding. With a purpose, so. <laughs> you guys are doing great stuff. Thank it's okay. You. Yeah, yeah, I don't feel guilty. I don't oh, feel bad. Shouldn't.